when we get introduced to Mad Eye Moody, right? And we find out that Mad Eye had been an Auror, and he, you know he's a little past his prime. Um, would be maybe be the nicest way to put it. He's gotten a little paranoid in his old age, and the Weasleys, Molly and Arthur, say, but Dumbledore trusts him. Page one sixty one. Well, back up a little bit. Mrs. Weasley says, your father thinks very highly of Mad-Eye Moody. Fred, yeah, well, Dad collects plugs, doesn't he? <laughs> Birds of a feather. Moody was a great wizard in his time, says Bill. He's an old friend of Dumbledore's, isn't he, says Charlie? Fred, again, Dumbledore's not what you call normal, though, is he? I mean, I know he's a genius and everything. Harry, finally, who is he? Because he's not privy to family conversations like the others. So that's when they mention, you know, he's an or He used to capture dark wizards. Half of the cells in Azkaban are filled with people he caught, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And then just before they get on the train, Charlie hints, page 163, that they might be seeing him a little sooner than they expect. None of them have a clue what's being talked about. Okay? 164, 165. Fred bellows out a window to Charlie. Tell us what's going on. And Charlie doesn't say anything. Okay. And Harry and Ron talk. And Ron says, Bagman wanted to tell us what's happening at Hogwarts at the World Cup, remember? But my mother won't even say it. Hermione, shh. Why? Because Hermione hears a familiar voice in the compartment next to them. Father actually considered sending me to Durmstrang rather than Hogwarts. Durmstrang, okay? And Hermione has actually already mentioned one of the other schools. So it was actually okay to keep them both on the first quiz. Um, because Hermione mentions it, I think when we're at the Quidditch World Cup, she mentions Bobaton. So we have Bobaton, which means what? Beautiful batons or wands. Okay? Durmstrang. What the heck does Durmstrang mean? It comes from these two parts of the word. If you reverse them, Sturm und Drang. Okay? I think that's making sure I'm not messing that up. Yeah, Sturm und Drang, which is a phrase from the 19th century romantic literature, romantic slash gothic literature, that means storm and stress. And in the kind of literature that this is part of, you see people put in kind of crucible situations. You, you kind of raise them to a fever pitch, and they act out their passions and emotions. Kind of the, the greatest example in English literature is um, the Brontes, Emily, I think, Wuthering Heights. Right? Yes. Sturm und Drang. Storm and stress. Okay. So this is where, notice what Malfoy is saying. Father wanted, to, uh, wanted me to go there. Why? He knows the headmaster, you see. Well, you know his opinion of Dumbledore. The man's such a mudblood lover. And Durmstrang doesn't admit that sort of riffraff. In other words, Durmstrang only allows who in? Pure bloods. Okay. But mother didn't like the idea of me going to school so far away. Father says Durmstrang takes a far more sensible line than Hogwarts about the dark arts. Durmstrang students actually learn them. Okay? Lucius wanted Malfoy to go to here, but Malfoy's at Hogwarts. Why? Keep going. Because his mother didn't want him to go because Durmstrang would be too far away. Where is Durmstrang? Close, we can assume because of whom 
or what country Victor Krum flew for in the Quidditch World Cup, which was what? Bulgaria. Bulgaria that that's where Durmstrang is. Right? So, Bulgaria, Eastern Europe. Narcissa Malfoy doesn't want precious little Draco to go that far away. Why? What's that telling us about Draco? What is he? He's a mama's boy. Okay? Notice, Durmstrang, they actually learn the dark arts. They don't just learn defense. They learn how to do them. Okay? Hermione. So he thinks Durmstrang would have suited him, does he? I wish he had gone. Then we wouldn't have to put up with him. Harry, Durmstrang's another wizarding school? Hermione. Yes. Horrible reputation. Puts a lot of emphasis on the dark arts. Okay? Hermione. Where is it? Hermione. Well, nobody knows, do they? Harry. Uh, why? Okay, that's why I said probably... Bulgaria. Why? A lot of rivalry between all the magical schools. Durmstrang, Bobatons like to conceal their whereabouts. <coughs> Where is Hogwarts? In Scotland. Is it in Scotland? We don't know. We don't know. All we know is you get on a train from London, you head north, and it's several hours. Okay. Four hours north of London on a train, you're in Scotland. It's, it's, England's small compared to the United States. Very small, right? Can muggles just, you know, out walking in the highlands of Scotland come across Hogwarts? No, it's got magical charms that conceal it, just like they wouldn't have been able to see 100,000 people for the Quidditch World Cup in the Roberts' field, okay? It was all magically hidden, Yes. Could be. <laughs> that would be another example of what I think is part of her failure as a, as a writer. Because you would think, okay, if they could follow the train, then anybody could follow the train. But can anybody else see the Hogwarts Express? Maybe not. If they couldn't see it, Bob's going nine three-quarters, Yeah, I mean, the train would pull out a platform in nine three-quarters, and Muggles would have no... Awareness of it, even though muggles can see the flying car. But that's because why can they see it when they do see it? Car's a regular car that Arthur Weasley puts, I don't know how to put this, he installed something that makes it invisible at times. Like you push a button and it goes invisible. What's the problem, however? It's not working properly. So at times it's invisible, at times it's visible. Right? When Arthur flies it, apparently, it's invisible. Fred and George, when they come and rescue Harry, Harry, okay? Ron and Harry, not all the time. Um, so Hermione says, bottom of 166, top of 67, well, you can, enchant, you can enchant a building so it's impossible to plot on a map, can't you, Harry? Er, <laughs> if you say so. Think of the leaky cauldron. How many muggles wander into the leaky cauldron? None. Okay? I do my Harry Potter course, and I know I'm kind of being facetious here. I do my Harry Potter course in London just about every other year. Students walk up and down Charing Cross Road to try to find the Leaky Cauldron, because the Leaky Cauldron is supposed to be on Charing Cross Road. It's between a record store and what? A bookseller, I think. We, we're told in either book five or book six. Well, the only problem is you can walk from the beginning of Charing Cross Road all the way down to Tottenham, course, um, Tottenham Court Road uh, Circle, where it ends. There are no record stores next to booksellers. There's a lot of record stores. There's a lot of booksellers. They're not right next to each other. Okay? So, because she doesn't want people doing this, actually, because there are a lot of weirdos in the world who take things like this and 
start to think it's real, like, you know, people think Jedi are real and hobbits are real. And There's a whole religion of Jedis, for example. It's really big in Russia. <laughs> a bunch of nutcases running around. Uh, that's why I don't go to conferences where people dress up in capes and stuff. I just, you know, sorry, it's just not me. Okay, so the Tri-Wizard Tournament. Um, let's see here. Malfoy, before that chapter, Malfoy aboard the Hogwarts Express um, <coughs> implies that he knows something that's coming up. And Harry, Ron, Hermione are all wondering, what is this? Okay. So we get to chapter 12, Triwizard Tournament. And let's see here. It's the big opening night feast. They look up at the, Harry looks up at the high table because he's wondering, bottom of 174, 175, who's the new Dada teacher? Defense Against the Dark Arts. By the way, and we're going to see that um, abbreviation. Pretty sure it's in number <coughs> five. This gets used as an abbreviation for Defense Against the Dark Arts. She doesn't choose that accidentally. Anybody know what this is? Especially in art? It's the beginning of a movement, or it's a movement in the early 20th century. Dadaism, okay? Which leads to causes, however you want to term it. Um, I'm going to be careful with my language here. To some extent, the breakdown or the demise of representational art. That is, the difference between Michelangelo, Rembrandt, Da Vinci, and their portrayal of the human form, and Picasso, or um, Klimt, or Clay, or um, Frida... I remember her last name, Callum, um, and their portrayal of the representational, or their portrayal of the human form. You can look at any portrait of a man or a woman written by one of the quote unquote old masters, and it's pretty clear man, woman. Look at New Descending a Stair by, I think it is Picasso, and you're like, hmm, you're not even sure it is human. It's because it's either a uh, series of geometrical forms. Okay, so Dadaism leads to that. Is Rowling suggesting some kind of corollary between this term as it's used in the book and that kind of breakdown of humanity in that art representation? Well, what do the dark arts do? Let me put it this way. Who is the quote-unquote master of the dark arts in these books? Voldemort. Voldemort. How does Voldemort appear? Not human. Inhuman. When he does appear, this book, when he gets a human form back, does he look like a regular man? What's his face look like? Snake-like, okay? And we'll talk about why when we get to that point in this book and then as we see a little bit more of why in the other books, okay? So, Harry's wondering, who's our new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher? Because there's nobody sitting up there. The chair's empty. They've got to have somebody. Sees everybody else. Pages 176, 77. The Sorting Hat sings a new song. Now, where else have we heard Sorting Head song? What other book? First one. Did we hear it in the second one? Why not? Because Harry and Ron weren't there for it. Okay. What about the third one? Harry wasn't there. Yeah, I don't believe. Harry and Harry and Hermione weren't there. Yeah, they had. Um, they were in somebody's office. McGonagall's office, okay? So, 
The Sorting Hat sings this. Now compare this song and the first song that we heard in the book one with when we start Order of Phoenix, the song that sings in book five. A thousand years or more ago, when I was newly sown, there lived four wizards of renown whose names are still well known. And notice what it does. <coughs> For each of the wizards, <coughs> it gives a adjective to describe each wizard. Bold Gryffindor. Okay. Bold Gryffindor from Wild Moor. Fair Ravenclaw from Glen. Sweet Hufflepuff from Broad Moor, or excuse me, from Valley Broad. Shrewd Slytherin. Okay. From where? Moor, Glen, Valley, Finn. What's a Finn? It's a swamp. Slytherin's a swamp dweller. You know, creature from the Black Lagoon kind of an idea. So, here are these four. They shared a wish, a hope, a dream. They hatched a daring plan. To educate young sorcerers, thus Hogwarts school began. Notice, they share a wish, a dream. That means they all have it. Okay? Now each of these four founders formed their own house. For each did value different virtues in the ones they had to teach. So here are the virtues that they each valued. By Gryffindor... The bravest word. So, for Gryffindor, you got to be brave. The bravest word priced far beyond the rest. Notice that. Gryffindor values bravery over everything else. Okay? For Ravenclaw, the cleverest, smartest, if you want, would always be the best. For Hufflepuff, Hard workers were most worthy of admission. And, and then notice this. Slytherin this time gets another adjective, but the other three didn't. Power-hungry Slytherin loved those of great ambition. Which one of these doesn't belong with the other three? <coughs> Brave, clever, hard workers, ambition. Hard workers. Why not? It doesn't really come out to describe like an actual virtue of someone. That, someone can be a hard worker, but it's not a virtue. But uh, or a hard worker, but no one can be a brave or a smart or a ambition. Okay. These are ideas. These are values. These are virtues. Okay. This is what? This is an action. Okay. Hard workers. These are people doing something. Yes, in order for someone to see that you are brave, what must you do? You must do something. Okay. Similarly, for someone to see that you're clever, you must show that cleverness. <laughs> Cleverity? <laughs> Smarts. <laughs> but this, this, there's, there's not a kind of a, a virtue that lies behind that that causes it to go into action. Unless you want to, you know, say, well, Roland just couldn't think of the word, and it's, you know, diligence, industrious. But I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think she uses hard workers intentionally. The next book, we're going to get these filled out. We're going to get additional okay, virtues for each one. For example, we're going to find out Gryffindors are not only brave, and we had this also in the first book a little bit, they're also daring and bold. Right? <coughs> Ravenclaws are pretty much just clever. 
<laughs> they're just smart, okay? But we're going to find out about Hufflepuffs. They're also what? Not only hard workers, they're fair, loyal, and just. Slytherins pretty much will stab you in the back to get what we want. Okay? So, while still alive, they did divide their favorites from the throng. What's the throng? Is it people wanting in? I'm just going to nitpick a little bit. Okay. Which population? Magical. Keep narrowing it down. What are students when they first arrive at Hogwarts? Yes. Okay, excited. They're children. What else? They don't arrive as Gryffindors, Ravenclaws, Hufflepuffs, Slytherins, right? They all just arrive as Hogwarts. They're just Hogwarts students, okay? When they first arrive, notice how they all, except for Malfoy and his goons, essentially get along and talk, okay? When they're huddled up together, getting ready to cross the, the um, lake with Hagrid. Why? They don't know what to expect. They're all literally there in the same boat, so to speak. Okay? <laughs> then what happens? Slytherin, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, Gryffindor, they get divided. So, while still alive, they did divide their favorites from the throng. The throng is all the incoming new, what are they called? First years. That's it. First years. Once you're out of that, what are you known for after you're sorted? From there till graduation. Whatever your particular house is. Okay? So notice what happens to those first years. What's the verb that gets used? They are divided. Okay? So, whereas when they first all come together, let's say they're all in this aisle, <coughs> they all have the same ideas, they all have the same values, etc. But once they get divided, once they get sorted, what happens? Keep going. Keep going. It becomes us versus them. Gryffindors, who's Gryffindors, you know, the Gryffindor house? Who's their greatest opponent within the school? Slytherin, which is also Hufflepuff's greatest opponent and Ravenclaw's greatest opponent. But, and yet we're going to find out in book five, Gryffindor and Slytherin were best friends. They were the closest of friends. And something happened. We'll talk about that later. So, they're thinking, how do we pick the worthy ones? That is, once we're dead and gone, how do we choose which students become Gryffindors, which students become Slytherins? Twas Gryffindor who found the way. He whipped me off his head. The founders put some brains in me so I could choose instead. He whipped me <coughs> off his head. What's the sorting hat telling us? This is Gryffindor's hat. Okay, so one. How old is this hat? A thousand years or more. <clears throat> Two, it belonged to Gryffindor. Now, for those of you who have read all seven books, in the seventh book, things that belonged to the founders of Hogwarts become very, very important. And yet the hat is never mentioned as one of those important things. The hat is never mentioned as a relic of Godric Gryffindor. What is mentioned as a relic? We already saw it in book two. The sword. Okay. Where does the sword come from? Who does the sword come to? Harry. What does Dumbledore tell Harry at the end of the book in his little debriefing session? Which he has in every book, by the way. Only a true Gryffindor could have drawn that sword from that. What does he mean? Harry, you really are bold, brave, and daring. 
No, he means blood. He is a true Gryffindor. He is descended from Godric Gryffindor. Okay? So, slip me snug about. So, what does he mean when he says, they put some of their brains in me? Cut some out and dropped them in. They weren't going to need them anymore? No. Close. We're going to see, at, towards the end of this novel, a new magical artifact introduced. The pensive. Okay? Notice how close it is to that. Pensive, just this spelling, means thoughtful. Considerate. You're, or considerating. You're thinking about something. This pensive comes from the French pensée, which means thoughts, meditations, and sieve. A sieve, you know, like a colander that you use to drain noodles if you're making spaghetti or something. Because what can you do with that sieve? You sift stuff. You, to do what? To separate large items from small items. So with the pen sieve, what are you doing? You're separating your thoughts. We're going to see Dumbledore kind of do this. And this wispy white stuff comes out of his head. And he puts it into the pensive and kind of stirs it around. And ideas come up. He tells Harry, it's very useful when you've got too much on your mind. You can do what? You can take some off your mind. Okay. Okay, first of all, think how cool that is. I mean, really, if there were something that could allow you to do that. It's finals week. You're thinking of one exam. You want to put everything else, all the other exams, away. You know, relational problems, all that, away, just to focus on this. Fortunately, we can't. Right? So, we see a variety of people get sorted, and we hear nearly headless Nick mention something about house elves, and what happens to Hermione? She goes ballistic. She's thinking, house elves? Wait, you mean like Winky? Page 181. Hermione, wait, there are house elves here? Here at Hogwarts? Well, certainly, says Nearly Headless Nick. Largest number in any dwelling in Britain, I believe. Over 100. I've never seen one. Well, you know. They hardly ever leave the kitchen by day. They come out at night, you know, do a bit of cleaning. A bit of cleaning? There's a hundred house elves. How big is Hogwarts? It's this massive, huge castle. It's got hundreds, if not thousands of rooms. Okay? Because you've got the dormitories. And notice, first year, Gryffindor, let's say, has a single dormitory that holds how many beds? Harry, Ron, Neville... Who else? Yeah. Seamus? Yeah. And Dean. I think there's five. Okay? So, but they're first years. So second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh years also each have a dorm. Unless maybe it's like, you know, freshmen at kind of residential schools. They all bunched up together. And the further along, the higher up you get in the hierarchy, you maybe by sixth or seventh year, you get your own room. You know, prefects get their own bathrooms, okay? <coughs> so, probably, at bare minimum, hundreds of rooms, because that also includes classrooms, it includes staff office, offices, okay? Households do all the cleaning. Yes? If it says it's the largest number in any dwelling in Britain, does that mean that Hogwarts is in Britain, not Scotland? Britain includes Scotland. Britain includes Scotland, England, Wales, and depending upon where you're from, what you think, Ireland. <laughs> Some Irish consider themselves still to be part of Britain, and others say, hell no. Um, but the Welsh kind of think that too. Um, just a little trivia. 
Wales and its derivative Welsh are not words that the Welsh use to describe themselves. They are the Cymru, uh, sorry, like this, and they come from Cymru because Wales and Welsh actually mean exile. They come from Old English. The Wales were the foreigners, the exiles. So when you refer to a Welshman as a Welshman, <laughs> you're saying, you're a foreigner. Hey, like in his own land, that's not something they really care for very much today. Um, because of the nasty things the Brits did to them, the English did to them. So they go on about, and Hermione's like, but, but, page 182. They get paid, right? I mean, they get holidays, don't they? And, and sick leave and pensions and everything. Sick leave and pensions. How elves don't want sick leave and pensions? Ron stuffing his face. So what does Hermione, you know, do? Well, she doesn't eat anything the rest of that feast. So is she going to start a hunger strike? That's what's implied. Okay. Rowling introduces through Hermione here, spew, I love her acronyms, Society for the Protection of Elvish Welfare, right? How much does she do with spew in 5, 6, and 7? Pretty much nothing. Why not? Is it unimportant? Is elfish welfare unimportant in these later books? No, I think it's because Rowling realized when she finished this book, and she then had about two and a half years before the next book, book gets published. I mean, it doesn't get published until summer of 2003, but it took her about two and a half years to actually get it written. I think she realized something. She shouldn't have gone there, here. That is, she shouldn't have introduced Hermione's my terminology, if this offends you, to them. <laughs> Hermione's social justice warrior mentality. That she is going to right all the wrongs of the world. In this case, the wrongs done to house elves. Think of what she's talking about. And what she wants to do with Spew. She wants to get the elves, first of all, pay. She wants them to have holidays. She wants them to have sick leave, she wants them to essentially have insurance and all this other kind of stuff. So what must she do? And we see her try to do this in the remaining, remainder of this book. What must she try to do to the house elves to get them to want these things? Okay? She wants to free them. How is that going to happen? Okay? Educate them. How? How must they be educated? What must they learn? The house elves. No, not respect. Just how to read? Nope. Freedom isn't a bad thing. What did Winky say about Dobby? Wasn't good for him. I mean, ideas above his station. You know, he's wanting pay and such. Where does Dobby go, by the way? Goes to work for Dumbledore, okay? What else? She's got to teach them what about their lives? Louder. Yeah, that their lives suck. <laughs> That's what they need to learn, okay? Think of Dobby for a moment. When Harry first meets Dobby, what does Dobby do about every three or four minutes, it seems like? bangs his head against the door, bangs his head against the window, talks about slamming his ears in the oven doors. Okay. But who does Dobby serve? Is Dumbledore Malfoy? He's a little bit more enlightened than that. Okay. He serves the Malfoys. They're rotten people. Okay. So his life is rotten. 
What does he say to Harry? They're in the hospital wing. You came and all of the dregs of the magical society had suddenly what? A light shining in the darkness. You kind of relieved our lives a little bit. Okay? So he kind of says, you know, the life of a house elf is not that good. Think of creature's life that we'll see in the next book. Not that great. Okay? But they're not the house elves at Hogwarts, are they? So Hermione must essentially get the house elves at Hogwarts to think their lives are miserable so that she can then what? Make their lives better. So she has to make them miserable. Why? So she can make them better. Who does this really benefit? House elves or Hermione? Is this all to assuage her you call this. You can't call it liberal white guilt, but it's kind of like <laughs> liberal white guilt, but it's not white guilt. It's liberal wizarding guilt. Human, but they're they are human, but I mean muggles have no awareness, so it's not just human. So it's wizarding part, right? Notice, I mean, when you really start to look at that and think about it, it presents all kinds of problems. And she completely drops it. Because I think it presents all kinds of problems that she, as she's writing along in book five, doesn't really know how to deal with. Though we do see, book five, how does Hermione treat creature? He's merely what to her? Misunderstood. If we just were nicer to creature, which is true to an extent, okay, to an extent. But if you merely treat creature nice, what does he do under his breath when he bows? There's the stuff in my blood, you know. He says not nice things about, you. in other words, creature doesn't care for you at all. We're going to see what turns creature. And it's not merely <coughs> being nice to him. Harry does something. He acts. He physically does something okay, that changes creature's whole perspective. So, um, Mad-Eye Moody comes in, and we see his face and all that kind of stuff. He's all beat up, scarred, worn. And we're going to skip a bit. Um, We go on to, we see Rita Skeeter's first real article where Arnold Weasley is described as screwing up. And, oh, I've got to talk about this. And um, Harry says some things about Malfoy's mother after Malfoy says some things about Ron's mother. Page 204. He says, oh, look, and there's a picture. Wow. Malfoy's saying this. Well, is your mom really that porky? Ron? Ron. Just shaking. He can't even say anything. He's so mad. Harry, get stuff, Malfoy. Come on, Ron. Oh, yeah, you were standing there, too. Tell him. Is she really this porky? Harry, you know your mother, Malfoy, and you know what's coming. Because if Harry's good at one thing, he's good on his feet. Meaning, in these kinds of situations, his reactions are perfect. That expression she's got, like she's got dung under her nose, has she always looked like that, or was it just because you were with her? <laughs> Malfoy's pink face goes slightly pink. Don't you dare insult my mother. Keep your fat mouth shut then. And Harry turns. Why does Harry turn away? I'm done, man. I just got you. <laughs> Malfoy, bang! Harry turns. Notice, as he turns, he's drawing. <laughs> okay? End of Chamber of Secrets, when <coughs> Harry <coughs> causes Lucius Malfoy to free Dobby. In the film, what does Malfoy attempt to do? Get some stay by 
He pulls his one. You've lost me my house, elf boy. You've lost me my slave, I think is what he says. And he pulls his one out of his walking stick, and he starts to say, uh. And Dobby says, you will not hurt Harry Potter. You know, and then zaps him down the stairs, okay? Malfoy, notice, does what to Harry's back? Curses him. Okay? Tries to shoot him in the back. And there's another bang. Oh, no, you don't, laddie. Harry spins around, and there's Moody limping down the staircase. And there where Malfoy was standing is a white ferret. <laughs> and terrified silence in the hall. Malfoy, uh, Moody, did it get you? Harry, no, missed. Leave it. Harry, I'm not. <laughs> not you, him, because... Crab goes to pick up the ferret. Moody starts to limp toward Crab, Goyle, and the ferret, which gives a terrified squeak and tries to, oh, don't think so. Points his wand at the ferret. It flies up 10 feet in the air, about the height of the ceiling. Fell with a smack to the floor. I don't know if you've ever seen a ferret. We've had ferrets in our house. We have one now. A ferret falls from 10 feet to the floor. It's a dead ferret. <laughs> they are very fragile creatures. Long sinewy backs, they break very easily. One of our first birds had that happen. Fell from the top of its cage. Broke its back. Oh. <clears throat> so, I don't think so. I don't like people who attack when their opponent's back's turned. Stinking, cowardly, scummy thing to do. And every time it's wham, wham, wham. <laughs> Never. Do that again. Professor Moody. Because here comes McGonagall down the other staircase. Hello, Professor McGonagall. She says, what, what are you doing? Teaching. <laughs> Moody, is that a student? Yep. No. <laughs> Why? We never use transfiguration as a punishment. Didn't Professor Dumbledore tell you that? You might have mentioned it, y'all. <laughs> we give detention. Moody, or speak to the fender's head of house. Okay, what's Moody's previous employment? Or, or, or. Put that in our world terms. What would that be equivalent to in our world? Okay. Not merely a cop. U.S. Marshal. More. SWAT. More. Black ops. CIA black ops team. <laughs> the guys who disappear you <laughs> into some, you know. Black site in the Czech Republic <laughs> for a little bit of questioning. Yeah. Okay. Or special forces guys who rappel down from unseen helicopters in the middle of the night and you're gone. Okay. What is detention? Time out. You really think somebody like Moody's going to think detention is going to do deadly squat? No. What works? As we're going to see in this next lesson, pain. You know, pain is a great teacher. Moody, okay, I'll do that then. And he looks at Malfoy, who is now back to being Malfoy, and Malfoy says something about my father. Oh, yeah? Well, I know your father of old boy. Okay, he's saying this publicly. All these other students are standing around <coughs> watching this. Now, if they know Moody's previous employment, which we don't know that the majority of Hogwarts students do, but Harry, Ron, and Hermione do, and you could be, I think, damn sure, they've probably started to spread the word. So when he says, oh, no, your father of old boy, what's he saying? He was on my hit list. Yeah, he was on my hit list. Didn't get to him in time. <laughs> well, I know your father of old boy. You tell him Moody's keeping a close eye on you. You tell him that for me. No, you had a house will be Snape, will it? Yes. <laughs> Another old friend. Hey, that just and everybody's ears are going. <laughs> I've been looking forward to a chat with old Snape. Come on, you. He seizes Malfoy's upper arm and marches him off. Ron, don't talk to me, don't talk to me. He wants to preserve that memory forever. <laughs> Meanwhile, Hermione's, oh, but that could have hurt us. Shut up. <laughs> Malfoy, the bouncing white ferret, 
Okay? So what's that show us right there about Moody? Rules, schmools, you know. Not important. Why? What did he say? I don't like anyone. Treating somebody with their back Exactly. I want to find the exact line. Thank you. Yeah. I don't like people who attack when their opponent's back's turned. Stinking, cowardly, scummy thing to do. In other words, it's one thing if your opponent's facing you, man. Go at it. But it's not honorable to do the other. Okay? So we go on. And Moody's going to talk, teach them, he says, about curses. Why? What did they learn in their previous classes? Uh, let's say first year. Not much, apparently. We, we hear very, very little about what actually goes on in the Dada classroom. Second year? Even less. <laughs> what they did learn has now been wiped away. Third year? Lupin's good. Yeah, they don't learn curses. They learn about magical creatures. Or dark creatures. He mentions 211. Boggarts, red caps, hinky punks, granny lows, kappas, and werewolves. Okay? And most of these, I think with maybe one or two exceptions, are quote unquote real creatures in fairy tales and the Scottish popular imagination. Especially boggarts, okay? Um, granny lows, werewolves, red caps. Kappas, I'm not sure about. <coughs> so he says, all this stuff, you're well trained in. Yeah, what else did Lupin train, oh, I don't know, Harry in? Expecto Patronum, okay? The Patronus charm. And hopefully you did watch that lecture where I kind of unpack what that phrase means. We'll see it again. So, Lupin was a good teacher. He says, so you're behind. I'm dealing with curses. I've got to bring you up to speed. And he says, Dumbledore thinks you can handle more than the Ministry of Magic thinks you can handle. He says, you're not supposed to learn about the unforgivable curses until what? Sixty years. But he says, Dumbledore thinks you're ready for it. So here we go. Mm -hmm. So what are the curses most heavily punished by wizarding law? Page 212. Bunch of hands go up. Ron, Imperius curse? He says, your father would know that one. Gave the ministry a lot of trouble at one time. So he pulls out of his desk drawer, big old jar with three large spiders in it. Pulls one out, Ron backs up. <laughs> Ron's already not right up next to the desk. Imperio, and what does he make the spider do? Hangs from his hand with a web and does like a trape trapeze act. And then it dances, like tap dances on the desk. And everybody's laughing. Think it's funny, do you? You'd like it, would you, if I did it to you? Dead silence. Total control, he says. I could make it jump out of the window, drown itself, throw itself down one of your throats. Years back. A lot of wizards claimed they were under the Imperius curse. In other words, it wasn't me. You know, it's like Flip Wilson in his old TV show playing Geraldine. It wasn't me. The devil made me do it. Well, the devil in this case being somebody else who had me under their control. Okay? He says, but the Imperius curse can be fought. What does it take? Real strength of character, okay? Better avoid being hit with it if you can. Constant vigilance. Constant vigilance means what? Always on the alert. Always be on the lookout, okay? Um, we we're still told this to some extent, but after 9-11, we were told, you know, be aware of your surroundings. Always be looking out. When I flew over to London 
in summer of 2005, the day after the London bombings, constant vigilance was in the tube cars. It's like, whoa, they're channeling the mouth uh, Moody. And you were told in the newspapers, on TV, on the radio, be aware. If you see something, say something. And that meant if you see a McDonald's bag sitting on a bench with not a person nearby, tell the cops. Why? Because that might be an IED. Okay? There have been places where things like that were IEDs. Okay? So, another one. Hermione's hand flies up, so does Neville's. Cruciatus? Your name's Longbottom. Needs to be a bit bigger. So he pulls out another spider. In Gorgio, he makes the spider now larger than a tarantula. Now, tarantulas come in various sizes. I've seen them as small as my fist. I've seen them larger than my hand. Okay? Yeah. I once did a stupid thing in high school after track practice. Went to the biology classroom and I didn't have a shirt on. And a guy had a tarantula there and I said, put it on my back. <laughs> you know, I still think about that every now and then. Because, you know, their legs don't move normally. <laughs> or rat they, they go in weird... In, so, he gets the spider to be larger than a tarantula, which I imagine is probably like this. You know, like its leg span is maybe a foot in diameter. So they can see this thing, everybody, very clearly. Okay, Ron backs up. <laughs> Crucio curls over on its back with its legs just twitching, rocking back and forth. Harry was sure that if it had given voice, it would have been screaming. Hermione, stop it! Why, is Hermione a spider lover? No. Neville has his hands on the desk in front of him, seat in front of him, just clenched white. Do we know why? Not right now. Not yet we don't. But even notice when we do find out later, we find out later, Neville's parents were put under the Cruciatus curse. Is this because Neville is thinking of that happening to his parents? Or was Neville there? Neville was there, right? Did Neville see it? We don't know. We're, never, we're not actually told that Neville saw this happen. Neville was in the same age as Harry. Yeah, you remember how long, right? Well, no, because we don't know um, exactly when it was performed on Neville's parents. It was after Voldemort's downfall. So it could have been a year later. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they did go off to um, Azkaban, but not immediately. So that's the thing. Neville could have been two, two and a half years old, which means, yeah, that would imprint in his memory if he saw it. He would remember that, even though it wouldn't be a memory he could access. Okay? So, Reducio puts it back in. You've got to imagine the spider's going. <laughs> You don't need thumbscrews or knives to torture someone if you could perform the Cruciatus curse. That one was very popular once, too. And notice what the Cruciatus curse, what you can do with it if you don't take it too far. You can torture somebody without Killing them. leaving a mark. Okay? Just Think of the, the possibilities that that opens, the ramifications within the wizarding world. Right? This is why it's an unforgivable curse. Because it can't, it can leave no traces, so you don't know who did it. Right? Last one? Hermione. Nevada <laughs> Kadabra? Ah, yes. <clears throat> the last and worst. Father Kedavra, the killing curse, puts his hand into the jar and this third spider's going, no, no, please, no, not me. Pulls it out, puts it on the table. Avada Kedavra, 
Moody roars. He doesn't just whisper it. Yeah. A little bit of dramatic uh, effect here. Flash of blinding green light, rushing sound as though a vast invisible something was soaring through the air. Instantaneously, the spider rolled over on its back, unmarked but unmistakably dead. Several of the students stifled cries. Oh, please! Like they haven't stomped on spiders themselves. Okay? But how is this different than that? Is it a painful death? It's instantaneous. I mean, how can you have pain if it's instantaneous? You can't. Okay? It's because it's that curse. It's, it's the curse nobody should do. And what does Moody do? He just sweeps the spider off his desk. Now imagine your student sitting up close. You want to back away from that. Not nice. Not pleasant. No counter curse. And only one person has ever survived it. And he's sitting right in front of me. Harry Sinkin. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. That's all I was going. Okay. So that's how my dad, parents died, Harry thinks. Just like this spider. Had they been unblemished and unmarked? Had they simply seen the grass of fleeing flash of grass of whatever, flash of green light and heard, notice what Harry interprets the sound that the narrator doesn't tell us what it is. Harry interprets that sound as the rush of speeding death. Is that death coming? Death going. Before life was wiped from their bodies. It's death coming. He'd been picturing his parents' death over and over again for three years now. Why? Because Voldemort told him, first book, your mother died trying to save you, crying, begging for mercy. <coughs> Not quite true. Right? Because when Harry hears his mother's voice, yes, she does beg for mercy, but she doesn't do it the way Voldemort implied. And he finally even hears third book what? Lily. Take Harry. Run. I'll hold him off. And we come to see later what a stupid thing that was to do on James's part. Why? He didn't have his wand with him. I'll take him on like Dudley fighting Dementors, you know. <laughs> you gave him the old one-two, you know, Vernon says. Harry's like, you can't give him the old one, too. How James Potter had tried to hold him off while he shouted at his wife, etc., etc. Harry knew these details because he heard his parents' voices. Moody goes on to say, All of you could use Avada Kedavra on me, and I probably wouldn't get more than a nosebleed. Why? He says, It needs a powerful bit of magic behind it. You're not strong enough. Do you think Moody yet knows? what Harry's capable of? Do you, do you think he knows Harry can do a Patronus charm? What, what is so significant about Harry doing a Patronus charm in his third year? Third year. He's how old? Thirteen. We are told by Lupin that is a charm many fully qualified wizards can't do. Do you think Molly Weasley can? I don't. Arthur Weasley? Yeah, he can. We're going to Do we see that first? No, I don't think we do. Okay. We see some other people's um, charms. And we're going to see in book five, Harry teaches fifth years how to do that, which tells us something about Harry's ability as a teacher. Okay, got to move on. A little bit more quick. Um, let's see. So Harry gets a letter back, finally, from Sirius. Remember, he wrote him at the beginning of summer. How much time has gone by? Yeah, about three months. What's Sirius been doing? He tells Harry, I'm flying north immediately, 226. News about your scar is the latest in a series of strange rumors that have reached me here. If it hurts again, go straight to Dumbledore. They're saying he's got Mad-Eye out of retirement. 
which means he's reading the signs. What signs? First book. Mars is bright tonight. Repeatedly. What other signs? Bertha Jorkins has gone missing. Okay. Hmm. And here he gets that letter and he starts to think about it. If Sirius comes back and is captured, it's my fault. What lesson from the previous book, previous two books really, has he not yet learned? What did Dumbledore tell Harry, one, at the end of Chamber of Secrets, about the difference between Harry and Tom Riddle? Choices. Harry says, then I should have been put in Slytherin. I mean, if I got a bit of, um, sorry, brain fart. <laughs> if I've got a bit of Voldemort in me, because Dumbledore tells him what? The night you received that scar, Voldemort, this is how Dumbledore puts it, transferred some of his powers to you. Harry rephrases what Dumbledore says. Anybody remember what Harry says? He put a bit of himself into me? Dumbledore says yes. Notice, transferred some of his powers is not the same as put a bit of himself. And yet Dumbledore kind of says, okay, Harry, I'll go with your interpretation for now. <laughs> All right? So then what happens at the end of the third book? Harry talks about the prophecy that um, Trelawney made. It says, so... If Voldemort comes back, it's because I spared Peter Pettigrew's life, Dumbledore says. Nope, not at all. Because what is Harry assuming there? What's he assuming about Peter Pettigrew? He has no choice. Harry is saying, Peter Pettigrew was freed because of me. Therefore, because of me, uh, Voldemort will return. Dumbledore's not like, no, you're, you're leaving out his free will. Go back to the second book. It is our choices, Harry, far more than our abilities that show what we truly are. <sighs> Harry chose to be in what house? Gryffindor. Okay. He says, Peter Pettigrew may choose to go back to Voldemort. He may not. He does, clearly. Okay. But Harry he is here thinking. Sirius comes back and gets caught. My fault. Why? He's assuming Sirius doesn't have any choice in the matter. What is this assumption akin to? Something that we were just talking about. It's like an Imperius curse. What do you do in an Imperius curse? We're going to see that, in fact, in uh, skip the chapter Bobatons and Durmstrang, I think. Where is it? Somewhere. It's when um, Moody is teaching them the imperious curse. To 31? Yeah, there it is. Sorry. We've already heard. He says it takes real strength of character to put this off. So he has various people come. Neville Longbottom does gymnastics, which normally Neville would never be able to. Um, Lavender Brown imitates a squirrel. Dean Thomas hops around singing the national anthem. And he says, Pot! Harry goes up. And for the first time we're told what it feels like to be a periodist. It was the most wonderful feeling. Harry felt a floating sensation as every thought and worry in his head was wiped gently away, leaving nothing but a vague and traceable happiness. Why? Vague and traceable happiness means contentment. Because there's no I anymore. 
There's no me. There's no my desire, my will, my want. It's all the person who's put you under their control. So he hears a voice. Jump onto the jet. Jump onto the desk. And notice, without even thinking, he bends his knees. Why? There's no I initially here to say no. But then that little voice does come back. Why though? Stupid thing really to do. And so, what happens? He kind of jumps and doesn't jump at the same time. <laughs> Smacks his shins into the desk. Moody, now that's more like it. Look at that, you lot. Potter fought it. He fought it, damn near beat it. We'll try that again, Potter. How many times does he put Harry under the appearance? Four more, and at the end of the last one, Harry repels it entirely. Why? He has real strength of character. Why does Harry have real strength of character and the others seemingly don't? What builds character? Adversity. Adversity. How? Just merely having a sucky life? It's not just adversity, it's one other thing. Having to do with adversity. It's overcoming it. It's overcoming adversity. What's adversity? School of hard knocks? Hard life? Is somebody being raised and being told, you can't do this, you're never going to amount to anything, you're sorry, piece of you-know-what, and still rising out of it. I don't care what your politics or whatever. Okay? Um... It's Justice Thomas, born, raised, dirt poor, southern Georgia, when? In the 40s and 50s, to be black and poor in southern Georgia, and to rise to become what? An associate justice of the Supreme Court. That's overcoming adversity. Okay? We'll see how well Harvey Weinstein overcomes adversity. I don't think it's going to happen. What else? Why is Harry affected by Dementors? Was Harry affected by Dementors? Because Lupin says, Harry, you've got things in your past nobody else does. It's not just a little trite adversity, and I'm not making light of it, of Dudley beating him up. It's the day in, day out of adversity of being raised by the Dursleys. Okay? It's the adversity every day at Hogwarts of knowing what? I'm Harry Potter. And everybody expects what? <laughs> Ollivander. We must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. Oh, thanks. Just put another thousand pounds on my shoulder. You know, I can hold it. Okay. In fact, Dumbledore is going to say at the end of this book, give it a little bit away, he's going to tell Harry, you have shouldered, shouldered the burden of a grown wizard. Now I need you to shoulder just a little bit more and tell me exactly what happened. And Sirius is like, come on, Dumbledore, let the kid sleep. He goes, no. Okay. He says, Harry, you've done what? You've done most. You've done more than most other wizards. You would think Harry would say, okay then, I'm going to punch my time clock. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. I, I get to go home and have the happy life. You know, let me be Sam Gamgee now. <laughs> I don't want to be here. I don't want to be Frodo. I don't want to have to go off to the undying lands. I, I, I want to stay here. You know, there's Ginny off in the corner. You know. <laughs> Leave me alone for a moment. Okay? So, Goblet of Fire spits out the four names. Is there ever really, really any doubt? I mean, if Durmstrang's there and Victor comes at Durmstrang, of course he's going to come out. But Fleur Delacour, what do we know about her? Zip. Other than that, when her name comes out, Hermione says, ooh, look, they're not happy. Well, they're not happy because each of them is not the one whose name came out. But you also get this impression that all the other Bulbatons are going, oh, God, no, please, not Fleur. Anybody but Fleur. Fleur is what? Beautiful. Vila. Is there much behind the beauty that we're told, that we're implied? We see in later books, there's 
there's some stuff behind the looks. That is, Fleur is not just a pretty face. Okay? Even though she does get the nickname Flim later on. So Harry's name comes out. And what do we hear in the chapter of the four champions? I'm skipping a whole bunch. Name comes out, what, that, what does that mean? You, you have to play. It, this isn't like Monopoly. <laughs> you have to participate. Couldn't Harry go, isn't there some fine print somewhere in the rules that says, if someone else puts your name in, you don't have to? I mean, shouldn't it be that only if you volunteer that you have to do this? Because I didn't. How could they prove Harry did not put his name in? It's real easy. Modern world, supposedly, a lot of people think. Sodium pentothal, truth serum. Here, veritaserum, veritas, truth, serum, serum. Just have a little snake go down to his office, pull a little vial out, put it in Harry's drink. Harry, did you put your name in the goblet? No. Did you pay somebody? No. Did you bribe somebody? No. Did you for? No. 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 <laughs> okay. Pretty clear. What else? Book five, for those of you who've read it, there's this little thing called occlumency and what's his op opposite? Legilimency or legilimency. In that very room are two people who we know could look at Harry and go, <laughs> I kind of assumed that Dumbledore was doing that because he said he yeah. it, it, piercing, like staring into his eyes while he was asking those questions. I kind of assumed that that's what Dumbledore was doing. Second book, Harry's hearing voices, you know, around the castle. He gets called up to Dumbledore's office, and Dumbledore says, uh, Harry, is there anything you want to tell me? Just unburden yourself. You know, Let's play counselor and counselee. Tell me how you're feeling today, Harry. And Harry says, uh, Nope, nothing. <laughs> and Dumbledore's like, all right, gave you a chance. <laughs> all right, okay, we didn't get nearly as far as we needed to. But we'll pick up um, real briefly Weighing of the Wands when we come back. So we might take the next one. Yeah, finish the book by Thursday. Because that way I can freely go back and forth. <coughs> Do we need to have any of the Phoenix, right? Um, no, because we're still actually on Goblet of Fire for Thursday.